Good morning, Loon Mountain Ministry. We are going to begin our worship service. I invite you to come on up to the seats. We're going to start by singing Graves into Gardens. In Loon Mount Ministry. I like this front row. What's up? All right. This is enthusiastic. What I'm talking about. Hi, guys. You can be seated. Oh, okay. What's up, dude? Good to see you. Um, nothing is better than you. I don't know about you guys, but I can sing that song when life's not going great. But when life is awesome, sometimes I forget about that song. And so we're here today to remind ourselves that, yes, when things are crummy, God is better. But then also when things are awesome, 
God is better. So thanks for coming to Loon Mountain Ministry. Welcome to the Coffee Shop Church Service. Uh, so glad you're here. Coffee Shop is open while we're going, which we absolutely love. Uh, this is our last week in this setup. So enjoy yourself. Get, get comfortable. Or actually, don't get comfortable. Because next week, we're pushing it all this direction, which is super fun. We're going to go that way a little bit, preparing for the growth, because we know when we all come back together in the spring, this gets really, really big and really, really fun. Um, and we also want to keep the coffee shop still open. So we're just kind of like uh, growing, which is a lot of fun. So this morning, Waterville's doing their thing down at Waterville. Uh, Pleasant Mountain is doing their thing. Obviously, Sugarloaf. Uh, Eunice is down at Gunstock at Alpine Church. So she's down there loving on them, which is super fun. Uh, and so we love being here. Sunday River is the first Sunday. Um, but it kind of feels a little bit more like winter out there, huh? But we're so thankful that you guys are here. I don't know about you guys, but this is kind of like the middle, I guess, of the winter. And so I'm just kind of like, I was, drag I was dragging my wagon, you know, this morning. So um, glad that you guys are here. So Jesus, we love you. We thank you so much. We thank you so everyone who's here this morning, whether people are on vacation, second homeowners, locals, seasonal workers, people that just got lost and found themselves in a coffee shop that church happens to be going on at the same time. Um, we just, we're, we're so thankful to whoever you've brought us and how we can love on them and they can and tell us their story. And thank you for music. Thank you for uh, frothing wands and lattes. Uh, we're thankful for your word, that we have it and we can uh, be guided in it by your Holy Spirit. We thank you that it's kind of looking like winter out there. Um, we are a church that prays for snow. And uh, we love you. Thank you for this Massachusetts and Maine vacation week. Um, help us locals to give grace at uh, Price Chopper and at the stoplights. And uh, help our, our, our vacationing friends and second homer friends to, to feel at home here in the mountains. We're so thankful that we have uh, a resource of the mountains to share. It uh, doesn't belong to anybody. And God, you knew who we were and what we were going to be doing when you called uh, the White Mountains up out of the, in the Pemichuaset Valley here. So, so cool. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing firm foundation. Christ is my firm foundation. The rock on which I stand. And everything around me is shaking. I've never been more glad. I put my faith in Jesus. He's Yeah. 
sing in Christ alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone this solid ground, firm through the fiercest droughts and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter.
To be reminded of Jesus, his life, his death, his sacrifice, and his resurrection are so evident. God, I pray that uh, this morning would be another reminder for each and every one of us that we are loved dearly and that uh, we uh, were given the greatest gift. You paid the highest price uh, to redeem us, to save us. Uh, Lord, help us to step into the grace that you've offered us. Help us to step into the life that you now call us to. And let this morning be an encouragement and a reminder uh, to all of us here um, that you are a good God, that you love us, and uh, that we can step into the life that you offer. We love you. We thank you that Jesus is, is the center, the cornerstone of our faith. And we put our faith in him. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys may be seated. All right. Good morning. It is good to be back. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Nathan. Uh, I uh, direct the youth group here at Loon Mountain Ministry. Last week, uh, Eunice and I got the opportunity uh, to be down at Waterville Valley Community Church, which was a lot of fun. Uh, it was a beautiful day down at Waterville. If you haven't gotten the chance to uh, uh, to either go to some of our other services, or maybe you haven't even heard of our other services that we do, we do a service up at Loon Mountain uh, every Sunday uh, at 11.30, so there'll be a, a couple of us here that will be headed up to Loon um, for a service there, and that's at the top of the gondola um, on Loon Peak, uh, or down at Waterville Valley uh, at 10 a.m., uh, it's kind of at the top of the carpet over on kind of the looker's right side. Um, but we'd love to encourage you to go and be a part of worshiping in the mountains. Uh, we find that the mountains are such a, a beautiful place that many people go to seek uh, God and and, um, and we meet them there and point them to the God that they're seeking uh, that is found in Jesus. So... Um, Please check those out. Obviously, there are other uh, ministries that, that we have um, we have opportunities to be partners with and to and to oversee, uh, like um, over in in Maine at Pleasant Mountain, up at Sunday River, uh, Sugarloaf has one as well, including and and Gunstock. So um, if you're if you're going to ski resorts around the Northeast, uh, we would love to encourage you um, to check one of those out. A um, couple of uh, kind of. So we're kind of in the save the date slash um, slash if you're interested in donating phase of the not so silent auction. If you are not familiar, that is our biggest fundraiser every year. It is such a fun event. Um, it's it's a space where kind of everybody who maybe has a hand in what Loon Mountain Ministry does um, can come together in one place at Loon Mountain at the Governor's Lodge. Um, we are going to be having our finale party on March 23rd, but the online auction will uh, will be live for an entire week beforehand. Um, one thing, we're kind of in the phase right now of collecting donations, and so uh, if something, if you have something that you would like to donate to the Not So Silent Auction, we would uh, we would love uh, to um, to have that. But um, essentially, uh, the the process for donations, um, if you're going to donate something, you can bring it right here into Encore. Um, maybe if you have a local business in mind um, that you'd love to go and reach out to, that maybe would like to donate something, reach out to them um, or come find us. We have uh, we have little cards. Um, that have like how to donate. We have fly. Uh, we have um, 
what are they called? Sorry. Uh, posters that we'll be putting up, um, different things of how to donate, how to go check out the auction and the different items that are currently up. Um, so, anyways, uh, save the date for that. Uh, a couple other things. The 811 Youth Shred Weekend is the weekend after uh, Easter, uh, formerly known as SFC Camp. Uh, registration is now live. That is for kids age 8 to 18. Um, so please uh, get signed up for that. I just checked the uh, ticket prices. If you don't have a season pass for Loon, right now you can get a two-day youth pass for, I think it's 97 bucks. Um, which two days at Loon, that is not a lot of money. So um, please get on that. Um, and essentially, the longer you wait, the more the uh, ticket prices go. Uh, the fill-a-bag sale, Encore, um, $5 fill-a-bag is starting uh, February 26th, which is like in a couple days, right? How many days is that? That's next week. It's eight days. Yes. Soon. Check that out. Fill a bag for $5. There's not a better deal around. Uh, we like to encourage um, our church to go and, and be in our community. Um, we find that that is one of the best ways to build relationships. Uh, the Kank Big Air um, is the next one coming up. That's on Saturday night, uh, March 2nd. Uh, if you're actually, we're having age groups all the way from six, six years old until, until you're no longer alive. So anybody... Can, uh, can come out and uh, join in for the Kank Big Air. It will be a lot of fun, 7 p.m. on March 2nd um, at the Kank. Uh, other than that, um, we'd love to encourage you, you know, be a part of uh, uh, def different groups that happen during the, during the week. We have youth groups that happen on Sunday nights from 6 to 8 here at Encore, uh, different Bible studies. Um, if you have questions about them, you'll see a bunch of different ones on the back of your bulletins, missional communities. There's also a board out back with more information about the different kinds of groups. Um, we, we find that community is so, so important in the Christian life. And so if Sunday is, is your only form of connection to Jesus, um, we, we, would, we would encourage you to step into community, faith, a faith community through something like that. Um, other than that, you can give uh, as you see. Oh, well, they're already going. Well, hold on. I didn't even release you guys yet. They already know. You can give. There's a QR code on the back of your bulletins uh, as well as the donation box. And we'll release the kids. Sunday school that's already making their way back that way uh, is age four to nine. Uh, the nursery is for age one to three, and the, they are right back that way. Thank you, guys. And I think we got another song. Yeah, we're going to sing Yahweh, if you want to stand and sing.
invite Tin up to lead us in this morning's worship or scripture reading. Morning, everyone. Today's scripture reading is Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 6 in the New Living Translation. Just invite you to read along with me as well. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you have been called to the one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. Thanks. You may be seated. All right, so this weekend, this weekend, and this week, thousands of people will come north on 93 who have never skied before, but have seen a commercial, watched a Hallmark movie, seen something on TV where people make these glorious turns down a white carpet that ends with a hot cocoa and a crackling fire, a wool sweater, and yeah, something awesome. And then they come and they put these things of metal and fiberglass underneath their feet with very uncomfortable hard plastic boots. And then they get to the top of an ice luge. And very quickly, they say, what did I do? And they make it down, either by a miracle or on a toboggan, <laughs> pulled by a ski patroller. And then they make their way into the Encore Thrift and Coffee. And they're like, I'm just going to do board games. <laughs> but we are actually experiencing that in the book of Ephesians, in the Christian life, Right? Remember what I told you a couple weeks ago, maybe last week, I had a professor that would say, when you see a therefore, you, has to, you have to ask, what is the therefore, therefore? And so chapter four starts with a big old therefore, all right? So if you pause, you go, what's the therefore, therefore? Well, last week, the therefore was just about the couple verses ahead, I mean, excuse me, behind the therefore. This week, the therefore is about all the chapters before these last three chapters. So chapters one, two, and three, this is what this, there, there's a transitioning happening. Remember, because last week, Paul had this kind of random benediction. It really seemed like he was wrapping up his sermon, then he went into more, right? So like, you've seen me do that. What I love it about today with, with the announcements, the kids were like, all right, we're done. And they just left. It's also happened to me too, when I do too much along of a sermon, the kids just get out of Sunday school and just start coming back in. They're like, all right, pal, get off the stage, you know? And so, so, so Paul has taken flight. And why I bring up this idea about these folks that have this glorious idea of skiing, and then they get up here and they have the reality of, of icy conditions and metal edges and uncomfortable ski boots, this is what Ephesians actually is happening. The first three chapters is God's glorious plan to save the planet. You know, it's his son coming to be glorified and to live a perfect life and to die a death and to raise again and to be seated at the right hand of the Father. And he's saving us through this. And so, so, you know, Ephesians 1, 2, and 3 is God's plan of saving the world. And most people are like, oh, that's great. That is all. That's awesome. I need him to save me from my boss. I need him to save me from my in-laws. I need him to save me from the banker. I need him to save me from my teenager. I need him to save me from fill in the blank. This, this, this sickness. This whatever. But Ephesians three or four, five, and six is what it actually means to be filled with the Spirit and the practicality of actually living according to the Word of God. That is the actually ap ap applying pressure to the edge of the ski in difficult conditions to make it through. So this is the application part, four, five, and six. And uh, highly controversial, but pretty talented when it comes to lyricism. Kanye West says this in his song, Hold On, Hands On. Literally, he says this. So he, apparently he knows about Ephesians, or maybe I'm just completely reading into this. I read the rest of the song's lyrics. They're actually one of his more appropriate ones. 
It says Hands On is the name of the song. And he says this. He says, we get called halfway believers, only read halfway Ephesians. That's deep. Because if you only read Ephesians 1, 2, and 3, you're going to be like, yes, I want that. God is glorious, and he is all powerful, and take that, boss, and take that, cancer, and take that, bank, take that, teacher, take that, mom and dad. You're like, woo he's a... And then you get to chapters 4, 5, and 6 about, what did it say? Always be humble, be gentle, be patient with others, making allowance for others' faults because of your love. Oh, you mean I have something to do in this thing? <laughs> so this is what Paul's getting to. And I think it's, a, it's pretty crazy that like Kanye West calls it out in his song. You're only a halfway believer if you've only read halfway Ephesians. Like, that's pretty crazy. And, and he's pointing the finger right at me because I, I love knowing the parts of the Bible that, that I think benefit me. God's glory, his power, his majesty, his creativity. But the practical application of the Spirit coming into my life through faith and then the Spirit working its work within me and living out the fruits of the Spirit through me, through my daily life, that is way more painful, more difficult, more grindy, more East Coast, East, East, you know, East Coast ice conditions than it is this velvety, fun, like, ah. Oh. So here we go. So I wrote, you know, this makes a tradition, first half, the big picture of God's gospel according to the, his glory of making, uh, of, he's, he's making all things able to come back to him through his son. The second half is the application, right? And our friend Kanye said, uh, you only get halfway called believers if you only read halfway Ephesians. So we are moving on to Ephesians 4. This is the practicality of how to apply this thing. Ephesians 1, 2, and 3 is all about God's glory. God's plan is all his glory. And Paul, in prison, writing this, says, I'm cool with that. It's easy, like I said earlier, right? There is nothing, there, there is nothing better than you. It's easy to say that when everything's great. But when you're in prison, writing a letter to people, it's a little bit easier to say there's nothing better than you. God's glory is what he's about. Remember I told that story about my friend who lost his life in a plane crash, and I just had to go into the woods and figure out what are you doing, God? You know, this 22-year-old kid who loved you, what's the point of this whole thing? And I, I had to come to grips with God's about his glory, about his glory, and i got to be cool with that. And so Paul's saying here, don't you get it? God is about his glory, but he is asking you to join his amazing plan. He's asking you. So now we're moving into 4, 5, and 6, chapters 4. Paul's going to give us instructions. Paul's going to say, this is how you join God's glorious plan. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Jesus, Jesus is just the, the, the masterpiece of God's glory. And he says this in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. The Son, Jesus, radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. And he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. When he had cleansed us from our sins, he sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. So that is what's happening in verses chapters 1, 2, and 3. Jesus, the all-powerful, all-beautiful, all-perfect, beautiful expression of God's glory, perfect expression of God's glory, came, it said, to cleanse us from our sins. And when he had accomplished that, he sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. So now... Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, because of all that, whether you eat, whether you drink, whether you sleep, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And a lot of us get excited if those are fighting words. we like, yeah, I'm going to get out on the street corner. I'm going to tell them where they're going. I'm going to tell them the truth. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to know my Bible. And I'm going to be like, whoosh, whoosh. We get excited about the power and the glory of God, and I'm going to go out there and defeat this, 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 this you know, political ideal or this, you know, this bad theology. Or you know, People get all wound up about this stuff. Well, let me tell you what Paul is saying. See if these are fighting words for you. See if these are fighting words. You're ready? You're all excited about God's glory and his power, and we're going to go give it to him. And then Paul says, this is how you do it. Always be humble and gentle. 
Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourself united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. How are those fighting words for you? How about that for a pump-up talk? Let's go get them, right? So I would say to Paul, all right, if this is my plan in the whole thing, if this, if this is God's plan, this is my role in the whole thing, how do you expect me to do this, Paul? Seriously? How, how do you expect me to do this? How, how do you expect me to be humble, gentle, patient, uh, giving allowance for others' faults? How many of you are going to give allowance for other people's faults on Route 112 here between the store and Dunkin' Donuts? The middle lane is for turning, people. The middle lane is for turning. I love it one time from one from Quebec. It, they had just paved the, the street and no markings were on it. And I'm just going down, headed west on 112. I think I was right in front of like La Hoots or Subway. And all of a sudden, someone from Quebec passes me on the right where the parking parking spaces are but they're not painted just boom i'm like all right (laughs) that could be a glimpse into the future of where we're going folks that could be that could be a traveling lane pretty soon um but giving space for other people's faults are if you're a big time skier are you giving space for other people's faults at the top of seven brothers chairlift are you giving them space for their faults in uh, Grand Junction, where all the beginner trails and the intermediate trails all come together. Are you giving them space for their faults? This is difficult. This is a difficult task. How do you expect me to do it, Paul? How, I can't do this. I can't do this. Have you seen them out there, Paul? Have you been here, Paul? And he says this right here. Make every effort to keep yourself united in the spirit. Look at your bulletin. The S in spirit, what is it? capitalized. You and I have no hope of being humble, gentle, patient, making allowance for others' faults without this capital S spirit in our lives. So the spirit, according to the scriptures, makes its home within us when we put our faith and hope and love in Jesus Christ and says, I can't do this on my own. I need you to come into my life. I need you to be humble. I need you to be gentle. And I need you to be patient in me as I make room for you. As I, as I, as I say no to myself and I make room for you, then you can do those things. Then you can do those things. Capital S. How am I supposed to do this? Well, capital S. When you have the spirit of the living God living within you and you make space for the spirit of the living God. So you are, you know, like like Moses, right? Moses went into the tent of meeting. The Bible says it. He went in the tent of meeting every day. And when he came out, you know what? His face was glowing every time. Okay? When we go into the place of meeting, now I, I get it. That my place of meeting with God happens really frequently, infre- infrequently. And the times when I'm in there, there's a lot of times I'm like, this is not glowing. There's nothing glowing with my time with God in here. Like, I've just thought about what I could make for dinner tonight. I thought about what I did have for dinner last night. And I thought about, ooh, what will I have in dinner when I go to Maine next week? That's, that's kind of my brain. Those are like the funny things. But then the not so funny things is like you start going down these roads of like, you know, bad thoughts. Or, good th- or then also I do this like no thoughts, right? Have you ever done that? Where all of a sudden you're like reading the Bible and you read like a whole chapter of the Bible and then you go, I have no idea what I just read. And I have no idea what I was even thinking about. All I can remember is just the tick, tick, tick of the clock. That's it. You know, and I'm like, I got to go read that again. That's okay. That's all right. But when we, in humility, say, Lord, I need you. I need you to fill me. Galatians 5.22 happens to me and you. And Galatians 5.22 says this, the fruit of the Spirit. So what happens, the Spirit does. The characters of the Spirit, the expressions of the Spirit, the, the flowing of the Spirit. These are the things of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, right? These are all fruits of the Spirit. 
Okay, Paul. So God has this plan, and it's all for his glory. And my place in it is to put my hope and faith and trust in Jesus Christ and then be filled with by your Holy Spirit. And when I'm filled by your Holy Spirit, I will live out love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Because I don't have that ability on my own. I don't have that ability on my own. Allowing the Holy Spirit... To, to use you and to, to, to be in your life is the same thing as trusting your edges as a new skier. Have you ever watched a new skier try to trust their edges? They won't. They just, no matter what you tell them, right? And then they just kind of do this thing where their feet just start going like this and their hands go back like this and then the lodge is coming at them at 50 miles an hour. And they're like, ah! And then they just kind of fall over and they still won't trust their edges. The Holy Spirit is something that we need to press into, we need to lean into, and I know that it's scary. I know that it's hard. It's, it's, con- it, it's not, um, what's the right word? It's not natural to lean into the Holy Spirit. And if you watch new skiers ski, they're like, this is not natural. But then you watch a kid who grew up skiing since they were two years old at the Kank rope toe. They don't know how to walk. You watch them take off their boots, and you're like, wow, how do you ski? Like everything else you do is unathletic. You can barely get in the car. But then as soon as you put that ski boot on, you're like, <laughs> through the woods, over the jump, around the thing, up the rope toe, and you're like, what is that? Just because they're so natural at it, they don't remember a time, right? Like my children don't remember a time where they didn't ski. They, did, they just don't even remember that time. There wasn't a time in their life, in their mind, where they didn't ski. And so what happens with when we spend time with the Holy Spirit, when we spend time in his word, when we spend time with his people, when we spend, when we spend time you know, uh, praying, when we spend time meditating, when we spend time, you get more and more comfortable with it. It's unnatural, I'll tell you. It's unnatural. But you get more and more comfortable with it. So now as we transition from this is what God has done and it is worth your time. This is what God has done, and it is worth your effort. It is worth you letting go and resting in this thing called the Holy Spirit. And when you do, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness comes about. So, then we move on from the patience and humble and gentle, making every effort to keep yourself united in the Spirit. Uh, Then it says, binding yourselves together with peace. What's interesting about Paul is Paul does not, he is very specific with his words. He does not waste words. Paul is very, very specific with his words. I think a little bit like the lyricists, like a Kanye West or some of these other lyricists, they don't waste words. If you read some of their stuff, you're like, whoa. Paul doesn't waste words. And he says, he says binding yourselves together in peace. Have you ever tried to bind something? Whether it's alive or if it's dead, it doesn't matter. Binding something is difficult. Whether you're binding grass or you're binding asparagus or you're binding uh, baby piglets, all are difficult to do, right? Binding take, w- takes work. You know, I remember when my cousins binded me in the woods, right? That took work for them because I was squirming and I didn't want to be binded by my cousins in the woods, which they thought it was funny. But This Isn't it interesting that he would use this word, bind yourselves together with peace. See, we like peace to just happen. We like peace to just come down like a snowflake, right? Doesn't it just kind of rest on us? Doesn't it just kind of like happen like a gentle breeze on a summer night? Well, a lot of the language that Paul uses is not that way. Bind yourselves together with peace. That sounds like work to me. And actually he says in Romans chapter 12, verse 18, it says, as long as it depends upon you and as long as it depends upon me, we must work for the peace. And I think that's what happens in church a lot of times. People will come here looking for that gentle breeze on an autumn night, and they feel like that's what's going to happen. And when they come into church and they have to do this thing called uh, make, uh, when they have to do this thing, make allowance for each other's faults. When people come into church and they have to make allowance for someone else's fault, they go, well, I didn't go there to do that. I came there to feel good about myself and to feel good about this thing called life and for someone to help my kid because they're starting to smoke marijuana. Can someone please help me with that in church? And all of a sudden you read this thing and you're like, oh man, dude, like 
this binding to each other with peace, this giving allowance for each other's spaces and rooms, it's, it's incredible. Uh, my wife has these different words she starts every year with, and one thing she uh, wrote this year for her word was self-awareness. I think that's two words, uh, but self-awareness. And her thing is she's really being aware now that when she's super cranky, it's because she's actually being very selfish. Like her crankiness and selfishness happens at the same time. And she's like, I've been really understanding now that when I'm really cranky, if I follow it back, it's because whatever my selfish desires were are not being fulfilled. And so I I, I think that's what Paul's driving at is the Holy Spirit helps us to be self-aware. And when we make allowance for other people, and that's the church, folks, when you come into this church, you are bumping up against people like me and Steve who are super loud and you have to give us patience. And you're bumping up against people like my wife and Eric who are now embarrassed that I said their names in public and they're introverts and you gotta give them space and room. And then everybody in between, that's the back of the house, this is the front of the house. And then all of you in between, have different political views, have different sports teams that you root for. Someone's a vegan, someone only eats meat, someone listens to podcasts, someone listens to the radio, someone only listens to Christian music, someone can't stand Christian music, and the list goes on and on and on and on. We're short, we're tall, we're wide, we're skinny. Well, all the different things we are. And right here, Paul is laying it out. Always be humble and gentle and patient with each other, making allowance for one another's their faults in love, making every effort to unite yourself together in the spirit. That's the only hope we have is the capital S spirit of God. And we are allowed to have the spirit because Jesus paid the way. And that allows it to come in. Anyway, goes on to say there is only one God. There's only one God, there's only one faith, there's only one baptism, one God, one Father of all. This was very important to the Ephesians because the Ephesians were part of a culture where there was many gods. Uh, Like a ton of them. Like Ephesians was the capital of worshiping every God under the sun. Thousands of them. What's funny is we as Christian Americans or we as like Americans are like, oh, there's only one God. It says it on our dollar bill. It says it, no, that's a bunch of baloney. We have millions of God in America. Safety, that's a huge God. Safety is a massive God, right? You want me to put a finger on it, this town? You want to know the number one God in this town? Children. I'm sure it's probably across the country, but this is the only place I've been an adult. Children are worshipped here. Worshipped here. And I feel so bad for them. Because guess what? the rest of the world don't worship them. And when they leave here when they're 18 and find out that the rest of the world don't worship them, it's a rough, that's a rough day. That's a rough day for little kiddo to find out that they don't worship me like home does. Seriously, when we make gods of something, we ruin it and we ruin ourselves. So I just put a finger on one that was difficult. You know what I got to be careful about? I make furthering and growing and the success of ministry a God. That's a good thing. Children are a good thing. Good gods are ultimately really dangerous. Because the bad gods, everyone's like, yeah, that's a, I want to get rid of that one in my life. That's hurting me. But here's Paul saying there's only one. Only one God, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father of all, who is in all and over all and living through all. This is a big deal to the Ephesians because they were worshiping. And they were like bold about it. You would go into that town and there would be signs and stores and trinkets that you could buy for different gods, right? We are more subtle about it. Until I called it out, maybe you didn't think about the fact that we worship children. But we do. Who tells us when to get up? Who tells us when to eat? Who tells us what to eat? Who tells us when we're sleeping? Who tells us when we're awake? Now I get it. We can all say, well, that makes sense until they're a certain age. No, I'm watching people all around me. They're 12 and 14 and 13 year olds are telling them what they're watching, what they're not watching, what they're eating, what they're not eating, where they're going, how much long they're going to spend there, when they're coming home, when they're leaving, what they're going. You're like, that's God. You are worshiping them. They rule, you know? And I have to be really careful because ministry does that for me. And who, 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 who hurts when I worship ministry? My kids, because guess what? I, I don't worship them. And ministry comes first, and ministry this, and you know, that's, that's a scary thing. 
So I'll end with this. This is what my wife wrote on the wall. I actually have never read this book. My wife did, and I should. It's, it's, it's a guy named John Tyson, and the book is called Intentional Fatherhood. But he has these rules for life. He has these rules for life, and, he wrote that, and Heidi wrote them on our dining room. Right? And this is essentially what Paul is saying in chapters 4, 5, and 6. And this is why it's not, it's not easy to sell 4, 5, and 6. It's easy to sell 1, 2, and 3. Oh, here we go. See, I've got to get done here. Um, all right, I'll end with this. These are, these are John Tyson's uh, rules for life, and he writes this book called Intentional Fatherhood. And this is what Paul is saying in chapter 4, 5, and 6, this whole humble, gentle, patient allowance for, you know, for others. How are we going to do this? We filled with the Spirit, but this is also how we do it more practical. Here's our rules for life. Number one, life is hard. Number one rule, life is hard. Number two word rule, this one hurts, this one hurts. Number two rule, you are not important. Number one rule, life is hard. Number two, you are not important. Number three, your life is not about you. Bless you. Number three, your life is not about you. Number four, you are not in control. And number five, you are going to die. This is his lessons for parenting. This is his lessons for raising kids. And my wife put these on our wall. Number one, life is hard. Number two, you are not important. Number three, your life is not about you. Number four, you are not in control. Number five, you are going to die. And when you adopt these rules, what I'm finding is they actually bring great freedom. They release you from serving yourself. They release you from being bound by all the desires that you have in serving those things. And you are able to look outward and upward. And you and I were designed to look outward and upward. And that's what's so beautiful about this. When we do this, it actually is the greatest fulfilling life that you could have. And that's what Paul's going to get into in chapters 4, 5, and 6. So there, if me or you or no one comes back next week, I don't blame you. Because chapters 1, 2, and 3 sure were fun. God saving the world. And now this is where we're going, filled by the Spirit, 4, 5, and 6. Jesus, we love you. We thank you so much for uh, the wisdom of a guy like John Tyson. Uh, We thank you so much for the wisdom of your word. Uh, We thank you, Lord, that we are able to do this, that we are more than conquerors because of you, because of him, because of the Spirit that fills us. We're able to be humble, gentle, patient, making allowance for others in love because we are united in the Spirit. Give us Give us um, directions, peace, strength, the ability to choose faith in you. Fill us uh, with the ability to choose to love you and to love others. Thank you for this coffee shop and the music and the coffee and people and chairs and all the things that go into it. Thank you for the mountaintop church services that are happening. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing, Be Thou My Vision.
Thank you all for worshiping with us this morning. You know, what sticks out to me from Marcus's message is just the reminder that without the Holy Spirit in us, it is impossible for us to do this thing called Christian living, Christian life, and following after Jesus. So we, we rely on the Holy Spirit. We boast in what Jesus has done. So have a great day. Go in peace to love, serve, and enjoy the Lord.